tell you're supposed to speak into the microphone? Can you hear me? Is that okay? Awesome. Um, so welcome to Code and Copy. Uh, we do this once a month, and for me it never seems to happen soon enough. And I don't know the first part, if you are familiar with it, the first part was where you get to hang out with a bunch of people. Uh, if, like, catch up with old friends, maybe make new ones. And the second part is where we have our talks. So, um, just to get a feel for the room, how many people have been before? Uh, okay. Well, that's a lot. That's like, <laughs> that's, I, I couldn't see people didn't raise their hands, but that's great. Awesome. So, I'll keep the introduction short. I'll just break down the rest of the evening. So, the first part, I just described. The second part, talks. Today, we have two. And I'll get into that in a bit. Right after, we have another social part. So, don't worry if you get to complete all those conversations we had to cut off right when the music started. Um, that's how we like to signal changes here, is we like to play the music. I, I like that. Um, my most recent work was we started doing that every time we have a major meeting. We'll just play like this or the Game of Thrones music, and people just go like, oh, meeting, yay! Very exciting. Yeah. Code and Copy, as I see it, as we see it, is a community stage. So this is where everyone gets to speak. It doesn't matter what your experience level is, so long as you have something to share about your experience or the tools you use in technology, you're welcome to reach out, make a presentation, we help you, like, we got you through it. Um, everyone else, they come to meet other people here, and they come to see what other people have been working on. Um, that being said, Code and Copy is also a very, like, we try to make it a very inclusive space, so we do have a Code of Conduct. Uh, it's up online, you can go check it out. Um, that I'll condense it, and if you haven't read it yet, you should, but if you haven't read it yet, just be kind to the people who are here, and you're probably good to go. So, our speakers. First up, oh, before our speakers, uh, we, we, we use Twitter, so if you want to talk with other people around here, code copy YBR, someone is looking at it. We are live streaming today's uh, thing, so over there, it will be accessible online through YouTube. If you're looking for the live stream link, just go to tweet, I'm tweeting it all the time. Yes. Yes. Um, Steve is tweeting it all the time, so, so you can reach it. Um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't come, because you can't, you can't even bring it unless you come. But, but if you do miss it, or if you're stuck feeling something. And last but not least, our sponsors. Our two sponsors, Mobify and Sauce Labs. They have been supporting us as far back as I can remember. Mobify lends us use of their space, their wonderful large space and their equipment. They've been really supportive of the community. And Sauce Labs, they made the rest of this happen. Uh, they even help us like arrange everything for you today. So thank you, Sauce Labs. Thank you, Mobify. Um, now we'll get to our speakers. First up, we have Kay, who's going to be talking to us about SVGs. SVGs, yeah. Um, is Kay here? Where's he at? Hey. <laughs> hey, come on. <laughs> Welcome, Kay.
Okay, uh, let's start. Uh, I'm Kay. Today I'd like to talk about the basics of speech animation. So the first three is with introduction. I'm Kay from Japan. And I work for Blanky, it's design agency, and uh, I work as a web developer, and sometimes I uh, sell uh, office participants, I really like coffee. And uh, mostly my work is on uh, WordPress and Shopify theme development, and plus one is my account for GitHub and uh, call them. So the, uh, let's start with the SVG itself. So SVG, uh, it represents a scalable vector graphics, and as you can see there is an ITIF XML format. So since it is not a pixel-based image, uh, the zoom or the size doesn't keep that image quality. So everything is done by vibration. And you can manipulate the all elements attribute by using the CSS or the JavaScript. Uh, this is my example. Uh, that is my logo. And if you open that kind of logo, uh, the viewer, anything like editor, you can see like the, like this. It has a lot of uh, this is small one, but it has like path and path, so it's crazy. But you can animate as it, yeah, as well. And this is the difference between the property, CSS property for HTML and SVG. In case of HTML, if you want to make like that kind of orange box, uh, you use basically background color and the border properties. But in case of SVG, uh, what you need is a fill and the stroke property. So there is a difference between HTML and SVG properties. This uh, is the place to start with. And even this uh, simple animation, it has like uh, this. So, uh, and the next one is how we animate that kind of SVG. And each way is SVG animation with CSS. SVG animation with CSS is for simple interaction of five keyframes. And the simple way I control this animation is there's a delay here. So we, I specify the delay this second. So since I like to add another animation at the beginning of the it's how to maintain several keyframes. If you want to change a lot of the uh, uh, situation or frames, it's quite hard to uh, maintain. Now this is one example I made. Uh, tweet this virus. So every virus after the first one. So it's kind of annoying and hard to maintain. This is uh, kind of the difficult part to maintain the CSS animation. And uh, uh, third one, this is the biggest problem of the CSS animation for SVG. The animation is not so consistent across browsers. Uh, this is a uh, browser support for inline SVG. Inline SVG is necessary when you want to make animation. It looks really good, uh, except for i8, it all green, but the problem is here. Uh, I and H, even the latest age, there's no CSS transform support. And transform property in CSS is the most important thing if we want to make animation. And this one? This one is really simple. In CSS, I just move in, transform, translate. That's it. Of course, this works in Chrome, Firefox, Safari. But if you open this kind of animation in the even the latest browser of the edge, this doesn't work. It just stops. So, in order to solve such inconsistency of the CSS animation, uh, the more advanced way is an exhibition animation with JavaScript. There's uh, many JavaScript libraries to make exhibition animation happen. Like the Grizzle, is a, I think the most famous one. Also, there's Velocity or Mojs, SVGJS, or VirusJS. And last one, Web Animation API. This is a native browser support to make animation, but still, this is under the draft. So, browser support is not so good. So, here today, I'd like to introduce the GSAP 
which is mean green salt. So, uh, it is that the, this library was originally made for flash climbing. So, since this exists, that error of the flash, the community, the community is so huge, and there's so many people have a lot of knowledge of the animation. So, there is a really big forum there, so if you have uh, any question about animation, you can answer in the forum, and the main expert can answer in your, in your, quest, your question. And uh, this library can solve and minimize the cross browsing issue, so inside the library, they try to uh, minimize the uh, browser difference of the big JavaScript uh, the method API. And you can make twin and timeline with this, I explain later. And this is very performant. So this is a uh, very basic to concept of the GSAP, twin and timeline. Twin, uh, this is good for animating uh, any pro animating property, and this is good for uh, a simple animation for one or few elements. And another one, timeline, you can make uh, multiple, multiple twins or timelines. This is good for sequencing the multiple twins. So this is kind of key value in CSS. And this is library structure. Uh, it has three marks. Three marks contains all this stuff. And uh, you can use like twin right, or timeline right, timeline marks, or just additional plugins independently. And this is the basic way, or basic syntax of twin and timeline. Like in twin, and this is a new that made the animation to change one state to another. You want to specify the target element and duration and what kind of animation happened. So this example is to make to move uh, to scale up the element double size within the point five seven. And for timeline, you can set this timeline, you can change the, these timelines by adding the, this to functionality. This one is a demo I made uh, with Greenstock. So in that this, it's uh, like, you can see the uh, function 2, or style 2, and I change this, um, change these twins. So since I can set up uh, multiple things, I can control uh, which timing what will happen. And good and I think good thing for this is as I explained in CSS animation, in CSS it is quite hard to maintain when the key frame becomes a huge. Because you have to edit it, you have to control its timing by setting the files from the beginning to end. But if you want to if you want to make set a delay, you have to add, you have to uh, change the files one by one. But in case of this library, you can see the uh, plus equal one or plus equal point two. This you can specify relative value. So here what it does is the it's controlling the uh, timing relative to the previous animation. So like plus equal one means that uh, start this animation after three, after one second of the pre, after a previous after this previous animation, it starts. So even if I want to add another animation at the beginning of that, I don't have to make changes of like this uh, plus equal one or plus equal point two. I can keep as it is. So the maintenance maintenance cost is not so high, and this is good for me. So, let's wrap up. So, for a special animation, if you want to make a 
3D animation. And she has access to this stuff. It's really simple. Um, and you don't have to have much knowledge about JavaScript. But if you can make the several keyframes and put into one animation. And if you want to make more complex one, the JavaScript you have to choose. And at least that animation, probably you will notice the knowledge of SVG itself is necessary. Because basically, that kind of animation is hugely dependent on the SVG structure. So if I want to make certain animation happen, first SVG element itself should be at the certain uh, structure. Or, like, if some element should be path, or some, should, some element should be cargo. And in order to make changes, of course, you need a SVG editing tool. And most famous one is, of course, the accelerator. And last one is a knowledge for browser. Probably, sometimes you go to a website, I mean, animation, you notice the website is very slow or heavy. And it's so frustrating. So, in order to avoid that kind of situation, what's knowledge for browser, like how CPU or GPU work, it's critical to make animation. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kate. Uh, we usually have question and answer sessions right, right after, so we have time for three questions. Right after that, because we have another speaker right after this. So, uh, the first question. Right here. Great talk. Um, I was just wondering, that frog enemy, how long did that take you to cover? Uh, actually, it takes hours. Hours? Hours. Yeah, but uh, for me, the uh, most uh, part I take time is debugging. But even if I use uh, such library, that's uh, browser key, uh, the browser inconsistency. Like, so it, mostly, the design animation is okay for Chrome, because uh, Chrome is really accepting the all kinds of syntax, even the, some syntax, uh, yeah, experimental, Chrome accepted it. But, like, Firefox is very exclusive browser. So if there's some syntax is very experimental or underdraft, uh, it doesn't accept. So, to get the difference between the browser uh, and uh, how to solve the difference, was uh, taking most of the time. Yeah. Thanks. Awesome. Question number two, right in the back. Can you mention any websites that you think really work in a good SVG animation for their design? So the question is, any websites that work really well with good SVG design? Um, I think I have um, I don't think I'm still right now. Actually, I post later on the meetup page, yeah. That's good. Awesome. Question number three. Right in the back. Uh, thanks for the talking. Um, I want to know that there is there something good resources for learning SVG animation? Uh, yes. Uh, like, in the SVG animation, there's a few, a few famous people. I mean, a good blog, how to start with SVG animation. Like, uh, website name, I hate tomato. <laughs> it's kind of a weird name. It's a developer to really hate tomato. Yeah, like in a very good blog, how to start with SVG animation. Especially, it's very good at the uh, green So, you can yeah, check it. Let's see, yeah, maybe you can remember, I hate tomato. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, those questions are really short, so one more. Just in case. Uh, in the middle of this, left side of the room. So just to clarify, anything that you can do with the GreenSoft, you can also do the CSS, but not in IE and Edge. Is that correct? Uh, yes, but there's a difference between CSS and animation and GreenSoft animation. Basically, GreenSoft animation animating the attribute, not the CSS property. Yeah. So if uh, some site animation doesn't work in CSS, but since we of use attribute animation, yeah. I think most are also it, it solves. But some of them make some program, yeah, of course. Awesome. Cool. That wraps it up for Kay's part of the evening. Thank you, Kay. <laughs> so next up we have another presentation. It's titled How We Almost Lost 10,000 Users and Mark of Tomorrow will be doing it. Come on up, Mark.
Hello? Okay. Hey guys, uh, thank you so much for having me here. It's a pleasure to present. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about how I almost lost 10,000 users. Uh, I think it's an interesting story. Uh, there's a lot to learn from it. So here's my Twitter. If you want to get in touch, go ahead. So first of all, uh, my name is Arthur. I'm primarily a front-end engineer, so I work uh, a lot with CSS, JavaScript, user experience, and I'm interested in a bunch of other stuff that you can see on the screen. Um, and I'm also the creator of a Chrome extension called Toby. And Toby is a Chrome extension that allows you to organize your tabs uh, into lists, and so you can drag them uh, and group them in lists. Uh, and it's a free extension, you can go to the Chrome store and get it if you want to. But uh, I developed this extension and I launched it last year in September. And it was a pretty successful launch on Product Hunt. Uh, I don't know if you use Product Hunt for, to follow products or anything, but having a thousand upvotes is quite a big deal. So we had a bunch of people comment uh, on the product. Um, and people were like saying that they loved it, that it was pretty cool. Uh, there's a comment that's pretty funny. This is lit. Uh, just going to the list and it's awesome. And yeah, a bunch of people gave uh, feedback and they gave a bunch of ideas uh, on what we should develop next. And that's what I did. I built more. Uh, and one of the features, the number one feature that people were requesting was that uh, Toby opened uh, optionally on the new tab. Because Toby is a new tab extension. So it's one of those extensions that every time you open a new tab, it comes up, right? So uh, people were asking, were asking uh, that that would be turned uh, optional. And I wanted to create this option here, but, to, but Google Chrome doesn't offer support for that. So I made it happen, and I created a, a way to make it optional, and I was ready for v0.2. And I thought I was all good to go. And this was Tuesday, September 28th at 10 a.m. I had to update the Chrome Store uh, screenshot, because there's a, every time you go to the Chrome Store, you see a screenshot, right? And I wanted to get the perfect shot for my extension. So uh, I went to my own browser, and I uninstalled a bunch of extensions just to get rid of all those items and have only Toby there showing up, right? So I uninstalled uh, Grammarly. Uh, I don't know if you've used this extension before. It's a pretty good one. And I saw that uh, this website came up automatically. Uh, and it was a form that said, why did you uninstall Grammarly? And I thought that was so clever. You know, the moment I was uninstalling Grammarly, that's the moment they asked me why. And I think that was so, so good. And there's a letter from an engineer. There's like a bunch of options to choose from. Uh, so I decided to postpone my, my launch a little bit and create a similar form uh, for Toby. And this is pretty simple. You just add a one line of code to your extension and you give it any URL you want and whenever the user uninstalls it, it goes to a page, right? Uh, and I had a website already. All I had to do was, to, was creating a form. And this is pretty simple. We, we do that uh, in a few minutes, right? So I decided to set up that form and that was the best idea of the day and you'll see why. So. At 11 p.m., I decided to actually move on with my launch the same day. Uh, and I figured it would be a very good time because the majority of my users were in the U.S. And, you know, it's not nighttime, you're sleeping. You would wake up to a brand new Toby the next day. Uh, and then I made this other little thing. I deployed to 100% of the users all at once. Can you imagine how that's going to turn out? Uh, Google Chrome takes about one hour to propagate your extension, right, to deploy it to all users. Uh, and it was 11.59 p.m., I was ready to go to sleep, I was feeling pretty happy about uh, my launch, when I received this first email from that form that I set up earlier, right? And the email said, uh, frequently crash, not working at all. And that got me worried. That's not the first email you want to receive after you launch something, right? And then I received all of these. And they were coming like minute after minute. Um, and that got me very, very worried, right? I was like, what's going on? This is super weird. Uh, and all of them were coming from that form, meaning that all of those people uninstalled Toby, right? That, that form was only accessible if you uninstalled it. 
and I was going crazy. And I, if you go to developer mode in your Chrome, you can select, tick that box, developer mode, uh, and that button pops up, update extensions now. You can force your, your extensions to update at that moment, because the browsers, they only check every five hours or so. So I was clicking that button like crazy to get the update myself, because I was not seeing anybody. And then I finally saw it. This was it. So this is a very serious one, right? And you couldn't do anything, like, you couldn't drag tabs, you couldn't click anything, sometimes you drop, the browser would crash, because what was happening was the page was actually reloaded over and over and over. So people had no other option but uninstalling Toby. So this represents my launch. It's pretty bad. And my first step was obviously trying not to panic. I mean, it wouldn't help at all. I had 10,000 users at the time, and I'm pretty sure that if all of them saw that bug, they had no other choice but we saw that. The second thing I could do, the fastest thing I could do, was reverting uh, the changes, right? And because I used Git, obviously, it was pretty simple. Uh, all I had to do was like revert all that merge, all the new merge stuff, and uh, trick the Chrome store to think that uh, this is actually a newer version. So I changed the version over to v0.2.1, uh, and you know, browsers would think it was a new one. And the third step, I had to just sit and wait, and wish that it wouldn't propagate anymore. And I had a mix pen in place, so I had all the analytics in real time, and I could see that it was going up and up and up, and more users were seeing the bug, right? Until this time, it was one hour later, one hour, 15 minutes later, I saw that it stopped. So it stopped growing, uh, and I was immediately relieved because that number was going up by the minute, and it was crazy, right? I was, I was feeling pretty hectic at the time. And at, at one, it stopped, so this is kind of like how I felt. Pretty relieved. <laughs> and I spent the next two hours just trying to reply to people and trying to figure out what, uh, what happened exactly, right? And, and then I figured out. Uh, so remember I told you that this was one of the features, like making it optional? Uh, the Chrome browser doesn't offer support for optionally taking a new tab or not. You have to choose whether you're a new tab extension or not. And the way I made it happen was a hack. And this hack was kind of like this. Obviously, this is just pseudocode, but uh, if a tab is a new tab and the user wants to be on the new tab, so if the user has that, that turned on, then open token. And this seemed to work pretty well in every test that I did. But what actually happened for people who got the automatic update because they already had the new tab as Toby was this. If tab is Toby, because their new tab was already Toby, and user wants to open Toby, then open Toby. You can see this doesn't work pretty well, right? It's like a opening Toby over and over. And the fix was very simple. If tab is, is a new tab and it's not already Toby, then you open Toby. Um, so the problem was an infinite redirect loop only for users who already had Toby in the first place and got the automatic update. So it was not affecting new users. It was only affecting my loyal and dear users who had to be already. So yeah, that was a problem solved. Um, it's kind of good that it happened at night because only 651 people were affected out of the 10,000. And I got about 50 angry emails because when they uninstalled Toby, they lost every single thing they had in Toby. Uh, so that's pretty bad. It was like a person who was super pissed because they had a two week research all set up on, on Toby and we lost it. So yeah, lessons learned. Number one, of course, make sure you test it well and test the updates. I had no regression tests. I had no staging environment, right? It was just like a, a hack. I, I, Toby was an extension I created myself, but I didn't have any, any of those set up. Second, avoid deploying to 100% of your users all at once. That's very important. And uh, I don't know if you know, but the Chrome Store has this uh, option here. You can deploy uh, to users gradually, right? Uh, gradual rollout. Uh, so you could increase that number 
uh, after you see that users uh, are happy with the, the extension and that no major bug came uh, with your new, new deployment. The third lesson was this uninstall URL. I think it's pretty useful to have one if you have a Chrome extension or, or if you have a way of asking your user why they're leaving, right? At the moment they're leaving. So that was pretty good. I think it's a valuable lesson. The fourth point, uh, obviously, in case of failure, don't panic. This is kind of obvious, but you should be uh, restated every single time because it happens. And the fifth point, tell your story. <coughs> that. That's what I'm going to do right now. I'm telling you the story uh, of a bad thing that happened. And sometimes you can make something bad give you good results, right? So it's an important lesson as well. I blogged about it on Medium, and I got a bunch of hearts, and I got a bunch of users after it. More users from that Medium article than from the, uh, the blog itself. But it was not on purpose, I swear. <laughs> yeah, this is just showing sort of like the amount of users I got on the day I blogged about it, which was 3,700 or something. I also got an award for the best extension of last year, 2016, from Product Hunt and Google, and uh, that was pretty cool. And today we're sitting at around 75,000 users, so it's a lot more than, than before, so that's kind of cool too. So yeah, now I just want to share a video. This video is like something that just got ready. I just uh, pushed today out to the website, uh, and I never showed, I've never shown anybody. It's just 30 seconds long. And uh, I would like it. Let's see if that is. Uh, there's uh, some on, if you use Yeoman, you can generate your own 
uh, common essential boilerplate. There's a bunch in React. Toby is written in React, by the way. So. Awesome. Next question, right in the back. So we have plans for turning this into a business. Uh, we're still like planning it, we're still talking about it, um, but so we don't have anything super definite. We want to continue to make, keep it free, but so the idea is to like focus on teams or something like that. Um, so we will focus on Toby for teams as a as a way to support uh, Toby as a whole. Seems to be working too much. Quickly talk to the guys from Momentum. Yeah. Yeah, they had a lot of installs, and they said, yeah, they got it the first month, like 20,000 pay for the first three months, and we got to pay customers. So, it seems to be possible. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people don't install Toby because they want to keep momentum. Yeah. <laughs> so, they want to keep momentum. Uh, I think we're in our fourth one, but let's do one more, so I can go ahead and throw it further on. Uh, right in the back. What, what's the significance of Toby? The name? You mean the name? Why it's called Toby? Uh, it was my dog. I had a dog called Toby. It's true. And uh, I couldn't find any names that were similar to Tab. They were not taken. So everything was taken. Tab, Tabby, anything you can imagine. So all of a sudden I remember I had a dog called Toby. It was my only dog. So that's why it's called Toby. And it kind of sounds like that. It works. Awesome. Well, thanks, Arthur. That was a great Thank conversation. You. Thanks for answering questions. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, another one for the Third part of the evening. Uh, don't worry, our speakers do usually hang around, um, so you can still talk to them after um, and ask them any questions if you want. Is that okay, Arthur? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Next part of the evening. Um, what we did want to do is we wanted to let people kind of choose whatever they want to do. So we have a much larger space than we used to have at the previous location. So there's there's that area over there. 